Hey everyone, welcome to another presentation for the course Critical Thinking. Today I want to introduce you to systems thinking, which is closely related to critical thinking because it too is a way to analyze and solve problems. According to one expert, a system is an entity which maintains its existence through the mutual interaction of its parts. That's from Gene Billinger. Not only does this interaction between the parts occur uh, within a particular system, but as with the human body, each system also interacts with other systems. This forms a kind of meta system. In the example of the human body, for example, the skeletal system, digestive system, circulatory system, and nervous system all work together harmoniously. Systems thinking is also a discipline for seeing whole, seeing holistically. It's like a, a framework uh, through which we can see interrelationships rather than just things or events. It's a way to see patterns of change rather than static snapshots. Systems thinking emphasizes mutual interaction. Something happens between the parts that maintains the system. To summarize, systems thinking recognizes patterns in these relationships and then uses that knowledge to solve problems and improve the orga an organization or a church or a family even or just your life. We call these patterns archetypes. The word archetype comes from the Greek. It combines two roots meaning first and pattern. And these original patterns manifest themselves in specific real-world situations. So there are what we call system archetypes. These are original patterns or templates that help us to understand real world problems. They are signs that point to an underlying system. Knowing these patterns can help us identify causes and design effective solutions. So let's look at some of these archetypes. First one is called delayed effect. According to this pattern, after a correction in action, there's always a delay period before the effects of that action become evident. As you can see in this diagram, that delay is signified by the two lines that intersect the arrow on the top. If this delay is not fully taken into account, we can overemphasize by taking further action before the effects of the previous action are really have had time to do their work. So the lesson here is by becoming more aggressive in our push for a solution, we actually make the problem worse. When what we really should do is wait, give the corrective action sufficient time to actually see if it's gonna work. The second archetype is called organizational immune system. Through a series of activities, a process of growth is set into motion. But after a period of time, the growth process runs into resistance. It's a kind of restraining or constraining action. And this constraining action is similar to the body, the human body's immune system. It seeks to return the system back to equilibrium. The system allows growth up to a certain limit, but once that limit is reached, it pushes back. It tries to push the system back toward inertia, back to its state of just uh, maintenance. So the lesson here is don't push on the growth effort side of the equation. Instead, try to remove or reduce the strength of the limiting factor. The third archetype is shifting the burden. Leaders address the symptoms of a problem by applying a short-term solution. It's always easier to look at the surface and just uh, say, hey, I know that problem. I look similar to another problem. And so we just deal with the, the symptoms. Since the short-term solution doesn't really address the fundamental causes, the problem continues to get worse. But instead of going back and starting again, this time with a solution that addresses the real cause, the system shifts its, its attention to fixing the short-term solution. So now we've, we've lost attention on what the real issue is. The fourth archetype is eroding goals. This is a type of shifting the burden pattern where the pressure to resolve the issue causes us to lower our expectations and settle for something less than what we had originally set out to accomplish. And the lesson here is persist in your pursuit of the vision. The fifth archetype is escalation. Most people are familiar with this type, this archetype, 
This is where two people or groups or nations even have incompatible goals. As one engages in activity to achieve its goals, the other increases its efforts to achieve its opposing goal. And this creates a self-feeding loop that leads to increasing conflict. The lesson here is look for the third alternative. And by that I mean a solution that nobody has thought of so far. We're, we're looking at two alternatives, my alternative and your alternative. But this is uh, through a process of negotiation. You're looking for a third alternative that, res that, that satisfies everybody. It's a win-win situation. The sixth archetype is competing resources. As the activities of an individual or group experiences success, more resources are required to maintain that success and move it to the next level. Meanwhile, other groups or departments also experience success and they too need additional resources to sustain their growth and success. And this produces a situation in which two or more success stories compete for the limit, limited resources of the organization. The lesson here is to keep both groups focused on the overarching goal that unifies them so that they can creatively find ways to increase the resources available. The seventh archetype is fossilization. When a new organization or project is formed, say a new church plant, there, there's a lot of energy, a lot of commitment, a lot of creativity. The organization grows, experiences success, and then comes a time when it plateaus. Now, plateau is not a bad thing. That's actually the best years of an organization is during that plateau time because it's just it's the machine is running smoothly. Things are great. The problem is that the methods and strategies that were used to get there over time no longer work because the external environment is changing. But instead of embracing new solutions to face these new challenges, the leadership insists on doing the same thing. Why? Because their past success has deeply embedded these methods uh, and means into their mental model of what it takes to, to, to achieve success. And so their very success has created a situation where their ideas are fossilized. They become rigid rather than uh, responsive. And that unresponsiveness can eventually leads to decline in the organization. So the lesson here is constantly introduce creative ideas and innovations into the system. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, you often hear people say things like, I don't believe in change for change's sake. Well, I actually do myself. I believe change for change's sake is good because it keeps the organization agile. So I guess that's kind of a conundrum there. You're actually, it's not actually change for change's sake. It's change to keep it agile, keep it flexible. The eighth archetype is failure to invest. In this archetype, growth approaches a limit. It, there's always a limit. There's always a, a, a peak moment when things begin to slow down or potentially begin to slow down. But as it approaches a limit, potentially avoidable, with investment. However, a decision is made not to invest, resulting in performance degradation, which results in the decline in productivity. And in the minds of those who opposed the investment, this only serves to validate the, their decision to not invest. The ninth archetype is called unintended consequences. It's very simple. A solution is quickly implemented to address the symptoms of an urgent problem and this quick fix sets into motion unwanted or unanticipated consequences that weren't obvious at first, but end up adding to the symptoms, thus creating a bigger problem. So what are our best practices with regard to systems thinking? First, learn the archetypes. They're really helpful because they help us to see beyond just the obvious symptoms of the problem allow us to look more deeply at the fundamental problems. Train yourself to see patterns, look for patterns in, uh, in events, in problems, in recurring problems that come up on a regular basis, on a kind of a cyclical basis. Look below the surface for fundamental causes and fundamental solutions. Don't just look for immediate, instantaneous uh, solutions. Avoid quick fixes due to the pressures of firefighting. 
And by that mean we're constantly rushing around, dealing with urgent. Take time to look for deeper solutions. Step outside of the immediate so you can see the larger picture and have the courage to tackle the tough problems. Now that's the hard one, you know, problems that you know uh, require a, a change at a fundamental level are much more painful sometimes than uh, decisions to just deal with the symptoms. So that's it. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you in the next one.